welcome to the ICT Pulse podcast. I'm Michelle Marius, your host, and the editor and publisher of ICT Pulse, the online publication where we discuss ICT issues from a Caribbean perspective. Joining me today is Peter Harrison, chairman and president of the Palisados Foundation, a nonprofit geared towards assisting in the continued development of new and existing technologies in Jamaica. Peter is also the Chief Technology Officer and Co-Founder of Colavor, a data center facility headquartered in California. Peter, welcome. Thank you. So Peter, let's start at the beginning. You are a Jamaican, born and raised, studied computer engineering at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Campus, Trinidad and Tobago, but have been based in the U.S. and specifically in and around Silicon Valley for several years. Take us on that journey. What was it like deciding to study computer engineering at that time? And how did you end up emigrating to the U.S.? Well, the decision to do computer engineering was actually made for me. I went to school in in Jamaica, as you mentioned, and I was interested generally in the sciences. And uh, my mother is a, or was a nurse at the time, and I was thinking of becoming a doctor. And there are the, the usual professions that people want to aspire to, the traditional ones, doctor, lawyer, sometimes engineer. And medicine was very interesting to me. So I would look at encyclopedias, I read about medicine. And one day I decided to try and get a, a good understanding of what medicine was all about. And I volunteered to give out library books at the University of the West Indies Hospital. And one thing that I did notice when I was doing this volunteer work as a teenager was how much of medicine was about human interaction. The fact that you were prescribing medications, um, making diagnoses, etc., was in many times secondary to that of the patient care. And as a teenager, I was impetuous. I just didn't have a lot of patience. And I just thought to myself that as a, as a doctor, I wouldn't make a good doctor. I would be good as the, maybe on the technical side of it, but in the human re- reaction and the human interaction, I didn't think that would be good. So I started to look at the various courses that I was doing, and I was doing sciences. And I said, well, let me see what courses I'm doing best in, and physics was one of them. And then I said, which one of these various areas of physics was the area that I found the easiest. And I found electricity the easiest. So I applied for engineering in in St. Augustine and got into the electrical engineering program. By the time I finished the program, they had changed the name of the faculty from the Faculty of of Engineering or Electrical Engineering to the Faculty of Computer Engineering and Electrical Engineering. So then the the degree that I got was thrust upon me. And so I left university with a degree specifically in high power engineering. So things like uh, power stations, large transformers, transmission lines, things of that nature. But my special project was unusual in that uh, I had done one of the electronics courses and uh, there was this project in which they wanted to make a typewriter speak. And it was the very early days of voice chips. And there were these various types of kits you could buy to make things, uh, make, make noises. And there was an electronic typewriter. This is um, the days before printers. And they wanted to find a way to interface with this electronic typewriter to this voice chip and then uh, actually speak. So the the little kit for this thing was very, very simple, but what you had to do was to program it. And that was the beginning of my exposure to computer programming. And upon graduation, I managed to get a job in the government of Jamaica for a facility that at the time was computerizing the taxation system. Uh, It's now called, or at the time it was called fiscal services. Um, I believe at at the moment it's called eGov near yes. UTEC. And so uh, I was there at the very beginning from the time that the, the first building was just being completed 
and then I was there for the second building to be completed as well. I went away on training because at the time there was nobody trained on the types of computer systems that they were using because the initial systems were granted to the government of Jamaica by the European Union and USAID. So I went away for training on computer systems. I maintained them for, for some time and uh, started wondering to myself, what next? And then I moved into the Jamaican private sector. I worked for a company that was selling PCs. And at the time, PCs were developing very, very rapidly. Um, the IBM PCXT had just come out. There's lots of software being created. There are lots of magazines. There's a lot of buzz around it. And when I compared my job in the government compared to what was going on in the tech sector at the time, it was just like night and day. And so I decided to leave the government uh, after about four years and work in the private sector for a few years to try and get a, a good feel for what the um, what for what the marketplace was. And it was a very exciting time. I mean, people talk about things being a very exciting time now, but in the very beginning of the computer age, well, the, the modern computer age, the age that people are associated with PCs and laptops and things like that, it was very, very interesting. Um, it was brand new. The, the concepts that were used in mainframe computing systems were just about starting to be accessible to everybody on a day-to-day -day basis. And I thought that the possibilities were endless. And it has rewarded me very well over the years, uh, the, the, the continued interest in this yes. particular field. So after working in the private sector, I decided to expand my education some more. I, I realized that I, though I had the technical skills, I didn't really have the business skills. And I started applying for scholarships. And I applied for seven years straight wow. to various, various government uh, scholarships. And I, I never got through. But seven years was a long time. And during that period of time, I decided to go back to university. I went back to the University of the West Indies, did a postgraduate diploma in management studies. And I decided that I would really, really try to do very, very well because though I'd done engineering, uh, I felt that the, the quality of my, um, my grades was not up to scratch. And so I really, really tried hard to do well. And I managed to get a distinction in the, in the, uh, the management studies program when I was working at, um, the, in the government and also in the private sector. And that allowed me to get through with a scholarship to Canada. And I went to the University of Western Ontario, where I did an MBA, returned to Jamaica, and I decided to do something completely different. I wanted to get into sales and marketing, and I went and started working for uh, Sangster Secures, which is now a part of the Ray and Nephew Group slash Campari Group. And I was selling rums and liqueurs to the gift shops on the North Coast. And then after that, I I'm, I'm went into selling pharmaceuticals, so selling antibiotics, insulin to doctors. And at the time, the headquarters office for the company I was working for was in Puerto Rico, and I wanted to move up. I was, I was an ambitious young man. I wanted to move to get into the Puerto Rico office. And so I was sitting in doctor's offices eight hours a day, and I was had an opportunity to speak with doctors for maybe only five minutes for every visit. I had to do eight visits. And so for many times, 45 minutes every hour, I was sitting down doing nothing, looking at people in the waiting rooms, etc. And I decided to try and rekindle my Spanish. And so I got a Spanish uh, novel from the, from the university bookshop, and I got a a Spanish dictionary, and I just dusted off my CSEC equivalent Spanish, and I started reading and reading and reading and reading a lot of Spanish to try and see how I could get in. And I went to various places to learn Spanish on a, on a regular basis, and I, I got better and better and better to the extent that I started really asking, who can I go to? And I, I went to, to somebody who was a part of the Spanish embassy in Jamaica at the time, and I started doing lessons with them. And they mentioned to me that the Spanish government was giving away scholarships quite often, but nobody was applying for them. So I applied for it and I got a scholarship to go to Spain. And I did a very lightweight course in Spain. It was a 
a postgrad diploma in, in international trade. And I thought I could get into the whole EU system. The euro was just starting. It was 1998, 1999. And I thought I could get a job in Spain, but it just never worked out. And I returned to Jamaica with my family and then started sending out my resume to all the major consulting houses in the Caribbean. So the internet was just starting. And so there was no such thing as an email address to send out to, to people. And what I did was that I looked up on the internet for people's fax numbers, and I faxed my resume to all the offices I could find of international organizations around the world. I mean, not so much around the world, but um, based in the Caribbean. And that led to me getting a, a role with the government of Trinidad and Tobago to help set up a trade facilitation office in the Panama Canal Free Zone. And I did that for a year. And uh, when that was coming to a close, I decided to put my resume out on the web. I, and I got these calls from people saying, we need you to do work in computer systems. And I said, well, I, I did that 10 years ago. I did computing with the government, but now for the last 10 years, I've been doing international trade, I've been doing sales and marketing, I've been doing all these other things. Why do you want me at this moment in time? I'm so old, I'm so stale. And they said, well, there's this thing called Y2K. And Y2K, for those who don't know, was a uh, was a situation that occurred around the, the year 2000 when computer systems, uh, older computer systems, used the last two digits of the date for um, for dates in in all sorts of packages. And when the year 2000 came around, the date was rolled over from 99 to 00, the last two digits of 2000. And so there was this mad rush to change out a large number of computer systems at the time. And so they needed people that knew some of these older systems. So I, I flew up to the United States to help them transfer the data from the older systems because nobody in the United States was using these older systems anymore because they just thought they were obsolete. Nobody could get a good job knowing these older systems. So I came to the United States to, to work on that. And then when I reached, I said, well, I'm, there's no way I'm going to get a good job in this older stuff. What's the new stuff? And they said, well, there's this company named Cisco. Cisco is a new hot thing. You need to become Cisco certified. And the job that I was doing was not very taxing. Um, the, I was working at the United Airlines um, maintenance facility up in San Francisco. And you cannot do very many changes in an airline without, in many cases, FAA approval. And so well, there's a lot of stuff just making sure that things didn't break. And so you're, there's a lot of time in which you're just sitting down, not doing very much. And so I started studying for the Cisco certifications. And after a year of doing the work for the airlines and Y2K had come and gone and no, nothing really bad had happened, I moved into a company that was doing web hosting. And this was around the time that the dot-com boom was happening because many people don't realize it, but... The whole, perp the whole thing of Y2K um, made a lot of companies in the year 2000 change out all their computer equipment all at once. So they got all this brand new equipment. And so now people are there saying, well, we've got all this new equipment. It's, it's too much for what we need. What else can we use it for? And so they started creating these outsourced services for the internet. And I worked for one of these companies. And... Uh, Right after Y2K, all these companies realized that there wasn't the demand for the internet that people thought there was going to be. And so they crashed. The company that I worked for almost died. And I was laying off people all the time. And in one of the very last layoffs, the last group of maybe the, the really good people went to Netflix. And Netflix at the time wasn't the company it is now. Netflix was still sending DVDs out to the to people, the, the headquarters office probably had about 200 people. And they said to me, Peter, you need to come over and, and work for us. You've been working in this web hosting company. We know that you've been handling downloads for various types of companies like the semantic antivirus downloads and some of the, in some cases, the Windows 95, the very, very early Windows 95 downloads. And so I said, well, as mo the moment I get my green card, I'll come and take a look. And I went over to Netflix 
and my role was to help launch the Netflix video on demand oh, wow. uh, when it when it was first launched. So it's the team. My team was about three, maybe three people, four people maybe, and so we launched Netflix video on demand, and uh, that that launched very well. And I wanted to do something more, so I left. I went to eBay, and then from eBay I went to Google, where I was dealing with things related to YouTube. So they must have thought that my my experience with Netflix was something interesting. So I worked with Google, did a number of things with them. And then the, the spirit of adventure continued. And a friend of mine called me and said, Peter, I have this idea. My, uh, I have a data center. The data center that I'm using right now has a, has a design flaw that is not really allowing it to handle the types of situations that are required of modern computer systems. And he said, would you be interested in leaving? And I said, I'm, I'm in, I'm in. And so I I spoke to my wife. I said, look, this is what's going to happen. Would you be supportive of me in this, of this venture? She said, sure, just go for it. And I went all out for it. And we've been very lucky. We, for, for, for startups, uh, they're, they're, they have a very high failure rate. Um, and we've have been lucky in that we've had very patient money in investing in what we've wanted to achieve. And one thing has led to another, and we are growing and growing very well. We're, we're a robust company at the moment, and uh, I have to be very thankful for that because there are many companies that just don't have that capability. Or, I can, or not so much the capability, but the ability to say that. And uh, it really is a privilege. Absolutely. Peter, I'm absolutely gobsmacked by your experience. I, I, you know, I, I framed the question and I have a sense of what the journey was like. But listening to you tell it, it's absolutely fascinating. I've been, you know, listening to you with my mouth open uh, just to sort of um, understand and appreciate, you know, that where you think your life, the, the path that you're on and how it actually evolves can be, you know, completely different from what you may have thought, you know, as a teenager or a young adult and, and, you know, deciding what you want to do in life. It's very, it's very important for, for someone in their, when they're trying to figure out what they want to do for their career to be in a situation where you have choice. Yes. If you don't, if you don't have choice, then you are trapped quite often, and you really need to try and figure out ways in which you can create choices. and And education is one of those areas in which you create choice. And then that can be formal education, which allows you to th- expand your mind, meet new people, think of new ways of doing things. Uh, that is one way in which you can. Uh, create choice. Another one is learning your, um, by yourself, do, do other types of, of activities. Um, and you also have to start thinking about your, the, what you want to achieve in many cases and whether what your company wants you to achieve is in keeping with what you want to achieve in the long term and to decide whether you really want to do it and, and what, and do you have the choices to, to make a difference. Um, one of the things that in, in IT that many people don't really think about is how things like documentation really provide you with choice. And the reason for this is, for example, you work in a startup and you start getting things done and the, the company starts to expand you can start doing more, you start doing more and more things, but you never have time to write it down. You, you, never, you never get to that point. New people come into the organization and they start asking you questions about what needs to be done, but you've never documented it. So you just say, don't, don't worry, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll do it myself. And then as more and more people come in, you start to be doing more and more work. There are people are sitting down on the sidelines not knowing exactly what to do. And so you find yourself being painted into a corner and what happens eventually is that you find yourself resenting your work, resenting your coworkers. You start to be, you start to snap at them. You start to get angry at them. And, and the whole reason why this is happening is because you have not provided yourself with the option of stepping away. Yes. And stepping, stepping away is a choice. And so if you can step away, then you can start thinking about other things to enrich your life. And so one of the things that I do when I, when I talk to 
um, young professionals who want to get into startups, who want to get into so many of these things. I always tell them, you know, make sure that you got this documentation in because it will really help you expand when the time comes. You, When you want to bring in new people, you can just point them to the documentation and say, this is what we want to do. Make sure you have the standards that people can sort of predict what you uh, had in mind. Make sure you have diagrams. Make sure you have that sort of stuff really well documented because it helps you to scale, to expand more rapidly when the time comes. Indeed. That's excellent advice. Uh, I want to just touch on, because in my introduction of you, I did say that you are the chairman and president of the Palisados Foundation. And I, and based on this, your, your journey and the volunteer work that you have done, I then realized that, you know, I guess the, the Palisados Foundation seems to be a continuation of that, of that strain of giving back. So the Palisado Foundation, uh, tell us more about it and how it came about and what it's, what need it's trying to fulfill. The Palisados Foundation is an organization, a nonprofit organization based in California, where I live, which is really working hard to transform the way education is, is provided in Jamaica. Not so much from the perspective of the um, the institutions needing to change, but in terms of helping students transform themselves from the student mindset to the mindset of a, of a new worker. And so what we're trying to do is to let them build on the foundation provided by the University of the West Indies, to build on the foundation from the U- UTEC, and for them now to start thinking about being exposed to the types of tools, the types of collaboration that is going to be required for them to enter the work world. So we are really trying to help prepare the Jamaican worker. And we are doing it in a, in a very small scale, but we've been very successful and we've managed to get a number of people on board to help us. We've managed to um, have collaborations with uh, the JPS Foundation, the NCB Foundation, the Grace Kennedy Foundation, companies such as Rail Decoy in Jamaica. Um, there are a number of restaurants in the United States that have been in- interested in what we're doing. Uh, one of them is uh, the Back of Yard and Coconuts in the San Francisco Bay Area. And what we have been really trying to see how we can figure out how to make students f- see or find a new meaning in, in education and, and getting themselves more acclimated to the environment. So the, the question really comes up then is, how did this whole thing start? And, and what has been the philosophy of the, of the foundation to make sure that students can have this opportunity? Well, it, it comes back to my experience in Google. I was working on one of these large projects and it was at the time a very small number of people on the project. It eventually grew to many thousands of people, but I was one of the very first people, maybe in the first six or so. And we were at a little event, like a, a lunch event. And this lady got up and started to say, well, we need to find some sort of commonality between all of us. How, d- where, you know, where did you all come from in terms of like, what school did you attend in the United States? And so she started pointing around, and it's a it, it, it school. So people were saying, well, I went to MIT, I went to Harvard, I went to Yale, I went to um, Berkeley, U- University of Santa Cruz, UCLA, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they came around to me, and I said, I went to UWI. And then they said, okay, so what about the master's program? The same sort of names were, were bandied about. And I said, well, technically, I went to UWI for that too. And so I started thinking to myself, I managed to get into Google based on my UWI education. So why not other people? I started just getting curious about the whole thing. And I got in contact with UWI faculty and some UTech faculty, and I said, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. And it, it, we, got, we got contact, we got feedback, we, things were happening about what I wanted to try to achieve, et cetera, and it, it faded. And everybody's busy. I was busy at the time. I didn't really know how to move it to the next stage of development of the idea. And I was invited to speak at the at a Jamaican diaspora organization 
um, conference call about ways in which we could find ways of giving back to the Jamaica. And I said, well, I have this idea. And they said, um, well, that sounds like a very good idea. Uh, we should try and find ways to get that done, how to set up a foundation for it, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they started going back and forth on it. And I just said, you know what? I'm just going to create a foundation myself. And I, I created a foundation myself, found a little man in, um, in Atlanta who was doing it for a very cheap price. I said, okay, thank you very much. And I got in contact with students in UTech and UWI. And I said, look, I'm thinking of doing this thing. I'm thinking of creating like a, a hackathon or a coding competition or something and seeing how we can get Jamaican companies, et cetera, to sponsor it, et cetera. And students said, well, that's a very good idea. Um, but we have a lot of hackathons already. We have a lot of competitions already. We want something that's more long lasting, more, more engaging. And I said, well, like, what do you mean? They said to me that Google has this thing called the Google Summer of Code. And where Google uses a number of software programs in its day-to-day -day life. And it invites students to work on some of these projects over the course of a summer under the guidance of a mentor. And when they achieve certain goals, they get paid a stipend and they can claim that they've done this program. And I said, well, that's really great, but I don't have the type of money that Google has. I think Google gives everybody $5,000 for the summer. And I said, well, I may be able to find 500 US. And so we started the program with 500 US with six students. And then next year we got a little more funding and um, I think we got six more students. I mean, this time we raised it up to $1,500 for the summer. The foundations in Jamaica that have been helpful with us have been very interested in what we're doing. And the thing is that many foundations on the island um, arrange their or have a focus for their philanthropic activities directed to education, mostly at the, at the basic school level and maybe the secondary school level. And there's a, there definitely is a need for that. But. I would go to the various uh, foundations and I'd, I'd tell them, look, if you think about assigning or allocating a small amount of money for university students, you would be able to align your philanthropic goals with the goal of actually hiring good talent. Yes. And so these organizations have actually provided um, mentors that are engineers to the students um, in some of these software projects. They've been um, a a evaluating their abilities to do software coding. And there have been a number of events and activities around the students to make this a, a success. And so I'm, I'm really, I'm really quite, I was really quite surprised to see this level of interest in what I'm doing. And I think we found a model for doing it that is sustainable. And um, I'm really looking forward for many, many more years of this. Um, another thing that's been very good in terms of the success of the, of the organization is that we really work with the, the student clubs. We work with the presidents of the student clubs. We ask them for volunteers. We tell them to make this known at their club meetings. We try to see how we can get um, uh, at, industry professionals to, to dial in to their their meetings to talk about uh, life in engineering or life in Silicon Valley or life in whatever, just to open the eyes of students as to what the possibilities are. And that has been, uh, I think that's been very rewarding. And I think the students uh, recognize the, the value of this and hopefully we can expand the program. The program is not aimed at providing opportunities for students for them to migrate out of Jamaica, because then you start thinking about brain drain, et cetera. The aim is just to open people's eyes, to, to let them have choice for them. There are many, many people who just want to stay in Jamaica. They, they have family there. If they do um, software development, they can make a very good living in Jamaica, either for Jamaican companies or outsourced work on a contractual basis. Uh, there's many small companies that do that right now. And so it, uh, the, the program helps to foster uh, an ecosystem on the island. It's a small step, and I hope that it'll expand in, in, in the future. But uh, based on what I'm seeing, I'm really glad to have achieved what we've managed to achieve 
especially as it's a, an effort that has been initiated by professionals in California, which is thousands and thousands of miles away from Jamaica. And yet we've managed to get this done. So uh, I encourage other companies who may be hearing this to visit our website, uh, palisados.org, and uh, get in contact with us, make a donation, try and see how you can make a difference to Jamaica's IT environment. Okay. So granted, the program has been running for a few years now. What has been your observation and experience of the Jamaican tech space and specifically with respect to software development? So in terms of the capabilities that maybe the students are coming with or what you might be seeing, I don't know, in the private sector when you, when you visit uh, and, and what companies might say that they need, what, what has been your observation on, on that front? Well, I must say at the very beginning that I am not involved in the Jamaican IT and tech scene on a day-to-day -day basis. So if, for those who are listening, this is not a comprehensive review of, of, the, of the industry. But the industry does seem to be vibrant. There are a number of small companies that are really trying to make a difference in the software development community. I've had the opportunity to speak and meet and have dinner and lunch with, lunches with a number of people. And so there's, there's, no, there's no lack of interest. There's no lack of initiative in terms of companies uh, wanting to make a difference or trying to make it in the, uh, in the tech scene. One of the things that I think many Jamaican companies need to start thinking about is that the Jamaican market is just too small for you to be, to, be, to be providing services. You need to start thinking of software development as an export industry, just like tourism is an export industry in, it, in which we earn foreign exchange. Even though people come to Jamaica, it's an export industry because we're earning foreign exchange. So similarly, we can think of software development as an export industry in which we're earning foreign exchange uh, for services that are provided. Um, it's a natural of, it's a natural progression from the call center uh, businesses that are there and, and that, that are working very very well and uh, competitively in the marketplace, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity. Jamaica has a number of advantages. We're in the same time zones as many of the, the United States um, time zones or cities, and we have a, a, a fairly good understanding of the United States culture. Um, many of us have relatives overseas, we've visited, etc. And so there, there, is, there are a number of competitive advantages uh, and of course the, the advantage of language. And so I, I see where there's this, this vibrant ecosystem and I, and, I, and I hope that there's a way in which companies in Jamaica will find ways to um, encourage uh, these industries through um, new innovative financing models so that they can actually launch into various markets. Um, that would be helpful, um, not necessary to, um, for them to find financing through banks, but also to try and think of financing through um, private equity or other types of vehicles um, for from investors that have a bigger appetite for risk. And so banks don't have a very large appetite for risk. Um, they want to make sure that they're deposits are secure, they want to make sure that there's collateral, there needs to be the development of, of, of robust venture capital uh, market in Jamaica for this sort of purpose. And, and it's there. there, there are people that are doing these sorts of things. But um, it'd, be, it'd be good to hear more stories around the venture capital and the private equity market where the entrepreneurs feel that they're getting a good deal. And I, I just get this sense when I when I speak with people on the island that they would like to see more flexibility in the outcomes as a as an entrepreneur, and so that they don't feel that they're being taken advantage of, and uh, have an opportunity to 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 really make uh, an income to make a to be rewarded for the time and effort that they've put into actually launching a company. On the on the student side. There have been some very noticeable observations on, that I've seen. One of them is that the students need to be more curious. Um, there, are, there are lots of resources out there on the web, but there are lots of resources um, available to them on campus. And 
to, to a large extent, when I start talking about things to the students, it, it, in many cases, they, they, they say, say to me, but Mr. Harrison, um, that's, that's such a big, such a big thing. And, I'm, and I, I talk to them and I say, and it's not as big as you think. You're in computing. You do software development. Um, lots of software out there is free. If you, uh, if you can, and you can find a way, you can use your laptop if you're going to have to use for your courses and classwork to actually do some of that software development and at least expose yourself to some of these concepts, it'll be really good. Uh, for example, don't just limit yourself to the languages that are taught to you in the university system. The university system is teaching you languages to give you an understanding as to what the various concepts are of, of a language. But don't be afraid of trying to learn a new one and the new constructs and the new things related to that. And I think that is something that students need to, to really think about. Try to see how they can really challenge themselves to learn a little bit more. And I understand perfectly well that it's a challenge. And some of the challenges that students have is that engineering and computing are areas in which there are very few role models that people can point to. Yes. Many people, many people know that there they have a there's a a nurse in the family, or there's a doctor in the family, or there's a lawyer in the family, or there's a, maybe a, a, like more like a civil engineer or contractor or electrician in the family, but somebody that does software development for machine learning or whatever it may be, that is a foreign concept. It's like knowing somebody from Mars. And so you do have to find ways in which you network with people in the industry, attend industry meetings, attend things, make people be aware of what you're doing. That would be something that I'd recommend. And the Palisades Foundation's Calico Challenge program, the one that I just mentioned, which is a clone of the Google Summer of Code, um, is one such way in which they can do it. Another thing that students could consider is uh, one of the things that I have noticed is also a lack of a presence on the internet for students. If you are a software developer, why is it that I cannot see what your code looks like on the internet? You say that you can do this stuff, prove it. And if you don't have your code on the internet, you don't have a website, you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you don't have a GitHub account, I don't see you making any sort of contributions to um, tech support or tech help websites like Stack Overflow, for example. How am I as an employer going to know whether you are suitable for my organization, right? And so therefore, it's the students that go that extra mile, that do those sorts of things, that will be viewed as having more more capabilities than the ones that sit back and just think that the jobs will come to them. Another thing that I think students should also start thinking about in terms of becoming more proactive is for them to start using the resources that are out there on the web. Heavily use LinkedIn. If you want to get a job, for example, at NCB, why not try to find uh, an IT manager at NCB through LinkedIn and get in contact with them and say, look, I'm interested in learning a little bit more about your stuff. Do you have any jobs available? Maybe you could just have a little lunch. And I mean, it could be just patty on a box juice, but I mean, you can at least try and see a way in which you can create some sort of a connection into the industry. Ask questions like, what sort of languages are you using? What techniques are you using? What sort of things should I be thinking about in terms of expanding my knowledge and understanding of the world. The universities can only do so much and no more. The technology is changing so rapidly that even with their best efforts, they probably won't be able to keep up. And so it's for the students to do some degree of self-education, to go the extra mile. And that is something that's really important. And that is why we try as much as possible to have them talk to people from overseas. They say, these are the types of possibilities. These are the types of things you could potentially be doing. And these are how you can probably try to apply them in the light of the, of the Jamaican context. The market that these students are going to be coming into is not just the market in Jamaica. And so, yes, 
if you leave and leave the university system and work in the in the Jamaican context, you may be doing tech support for uh, uh, some sort of a company. But then there is the opportunity for you to be doing outsource work in software development for companies overseas. And then how do you compete on that if you don't have a visible presence on the web? How do you prove to yourself that you or prove to other people that you're valuable? How do you prove to other companies in Jamaica that you're valuable? And so those are the types of things that I think students really need to start thinking about, f- building ways in which they are very capable and can prove that they have the skills. Um, one of the things that I do when I'm interviewing um, persons for roles at my company is that I will have a, a phone interview and I ask them very, very precise, very predefined questions. And if somebody answers those questions correctly, they come into my office and I ask them the same questions and I say, prove it on a computer. I, just, I hand them a, a laptop and I say, show me. And if they just, if they cannot show me, then they are not any good to me as a company. And so students need to start becoming very, very aware of this sort of thing that they need to start working on the job as quickly as possible. They need to be able to not be a burden to the company because they now have to be trained on new, new systems excessively to get up to speed. Um, I also implore them to embrace open source software a lot. My company, we use open source a great deal. We have, I think, somewhere in the region of maybe about 50 computer servers, maybe more, could be closer to 60, 60 computer servers. And of that number, only three run Windows. Mm. And so... And so we do everything with open source. We look at documentation. We document all our stuff. And that has been very helpful to us. As a startup, paying for licenses for software is just too onerous. And so if you can find ways in which you can use soft, open source software to help things, then I think it, it really works for the better. And if you, as a user of open source software, find a bug, once again, I implore you to interact with the community. Make mention of the bug on the, on the software um, project's um, website. I think I have submitted maybe about a dozen bugs on, on, in software since I have been working at, uh, at Colovore. And so I do software development. I'm, I'm way older than many of the students. I'm, I'm in my 50s at the moment. And I've written maybe 60,000 lines of code for a billing system. And so my education has not ended. Five years ago, I did not know how to write code in Python. I knew other languages, and I said, Python is a new hot thing. Let me learn it. And I learned it at my age. Students need to have that same sort of curiosity. And I, I, really, I really challenge them to do it. It's very important if you want to succeed in this industry that is rapidly evolving, what else can you do? Absolutely. Uh, these are some fascinating insights because I would not have picked the younger generation to perhaps in, to the degree that you have communicated and perhaps not be as proactive. I, you know, I probably would have thought that they may have been a little bit more tech savvy and, and, and a lot of focus being placed on like personal branding and therefore being able to put themselves out a bit more. And the whole issue about maybe being not sharing as much uh, as you were just recently talking about in terms of, you know, if they find a bug to share it with the community, et cetera. One of the things that I would I'd like to leave with is... And I, I, I really would want to make sure that everybody that listens to this podcast has a number of thoughts that they leave with. No matter what all the other stuff that I've spoken about is that as an entrepreneur, as a person in your personal life, you have to try and try again. You just keep trying and trying and you make sure that you open up those choices and you keep trying. That's the first thing. So make sure you have the options and you try for each one of them. And then the other thing is, I really would recommend to people to ask for what they want. Don't assume. Don't assume you're going to get that job promotion. Don't assume that you're going to get that sale. Don't assume that things are going to go your way. 
ask for what you want because that's the only way people are going to know exactly where you stand. And so when we were looking for funding, we asked for what we wanted. And ultimately, we got what we wanted because we didn't, there didn't need to be this um, type of um, telepathy in which people sort of predicted what you wanted to do. And so those two things are, are very important. And then finally, for you to succeed, um, this is something that I, I heard from, um, I think it's Tammy Wynette or one of these country singers, you have to be first, best or different. And so if you can be first, best or different, try, try again with the various types of options that you have, then when you ask for the business, when you ask for what you want, you have a greater chance of success. Thank you so much, Peter. I am absolutely fascinated and I'm actually looking forward to uh, listening to this uh, discussion again because there was just so many excellent nuggets that you shared. You're welcome. I wish, uh, I, I, hope, I hope this has been, um, uh, th this has been a very rewarding uh, opportunity to speak about the Caribbean and Jamaica and I hope that this has been useful to many of your listeners. That's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening to the ICT Pulse podcast. You can find links to some of the things we talked about on our website, ict-pulse.com. If you like this episode, please show your support by leaving us a review on iTunes as it will help others find the show. You can email us at info at ict-pulse.com or drop us a note on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash ICT Pulse or via Twitter at ICT Pulse. We hope you'll join us again for our next episode. Take care.